Uh, hello, seminarians, and welcome to our second video uh, of uh, Shakespeare's other disability plays. Um, we uh, just wanted to take some time to talk with you about the things that we saw coming up in your rich and wonderful first set of blog posts. Um, and uh, maybe start to tie some ideas together so we can be thinking um, with and alongside one another as we are going forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is so, going to be very informal. We yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Christmas Eve and we are, you know, just doing this as we can. So, um, and, and we, um, both of us are basing this work off of just the like most yeah. provisional of notes. So please forgive us the amount of paper shuffling that's about to happen. <laughs> There's going to be a lot. Um, Cause you know, we're all people. We have beverages, we're people. It's great. Um, <laughs> we like seeing people. Okay. Um, so we still see a lot of work with language and performance and we love the way that you're incorporating um, the ideas of um, ability into your papers as well. Um, as far as language is concerned, I am particularly delighted by um, the, the way that Susan and Penny are approaching language as well as John. Um, the, the real close attention um, to, uh, you know, particular laws, to thinking about hyper ability and fluency, um, that stuff is super exciting to me. Um, and for performance, uh, I think Lindsay's going to pick that up. Yeah, I am continue to be thrilled by the work that's happening here on disability and performance. Um, something that really struck me as I was reading through these um, was how much new territory I see being mapped out by this work that has not been covered by disability performance work already. Um, and how much even this mapping is showing us the empty spaces that have yet to be addressed at all in terms of disability performance. And I mean, it just became really clear to me as I was just sort of like flipping through right, the Zotero of my mind um, that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, research that has come out on early modern disability has been hugely performance focused, right? Mm -hmm. um, Shakespeare focused in particular, but performance in general. And, um, you know, uh, like Genevieve Love's book, uh, which is all about actors and actors' bodies. And um, my book is all about disability performance. And I know Catherine Shop Williams has a book that's about to come out. It's all on disability performance and the, um, the fabulous uh, early theater issue that, that uh, Susan edited and I was privileged to be in all early theater, right? Like there's, uh, there's just been so much on that. And yet I, I absolutely want all of you to uh, hear, right, really loudly, that there is still so much left to be done. The, the work that's been done on disability performance is by no means definitive um, and by no means uh, completist. There's, there's just tons and tons and tons. And so I'm really excited to see you doing that. And um, uh, I would just encourage you to keep heading in that direction, in the new directions that you are, you are taking things. Um, there's just, as with everything disability related, there's just a lot left to do. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, tons. And this is, this is something that I should have said also about the language stuff, right? The, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there's, there is very little on disability poetics, on, mm -hmm. um, even, mm -hmm. even in contemporary poetry where there is more, yeah. there is still very little. Uh, um, and so it's like egregious almost how little yeah. that is. It's shocking. Uh, well, and it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it, this is my own sort of theory, but it's, you know, it's partially because a lot of the disability studies theory hinges on narrative. And so it's right. difficult for people who are finding a way in the field to think about language level issues, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sentence structure, mm -hmm. syntax, yep. register, which was a good term, um, I think that Susan mm -hmm. brought up, um, the, and just prosody, right? Like there's just, there's just not, um, mm -hmm. 
there's just there's just not a lot of like background for that and you can get into like lyric theory right mm -hmm. but that is a whole nother thing <laughs> um, right and also kind of a contentious field and so you know the the disability studies part of that is is a lot harder i think mm -hmm. um because there's um there's less to just structure it on like mitchell and snyder mm -hmm. right it's all about narrative mm -hmm. um yep. so so yeah the language stuff is particularly delightful to me because like we need that i think in yeah. disability studies a lot i just I just also want to say that, like, as I'm hearing us talk, I'm realizing that there's a subtext <laughs> that we haven't talked about, which yeah. is that Billy and I are both really aware of the fact that disability studies scholars, um, particularly in the early modern period, have to do a lot of defense of our own work. And yes. I think what, what I was trying to say is don't let your dissertation advisor or journal editor or, you know, tenure committee or whoever if you're working on performance, say, well, hasn't that already been done, right? Like, isn't there stuff right. out there on that? No, there's not nearly enough. Yeah. And what I'm hearing Billy say is, um, don't let your dissertation advisor or, you know, editor or whoever, um, or the like awful voice in the back of your head, right? That's my main problem. That's my, that's um, my is, <laughs> Yeah, uh, don't, don't let that voice say, well, is there really anything to be said about disability and language or disability and poetics because a thousand percent there is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah so we just want to yeah. affirm that great work that we're seeing you doing and we want to um we want to talk down that voice uh whether it's in your head or external to it um yeah uh, and connected and connected to that talking down of the voice i'm so sorry to interrupt you but i just want to get this okay, in okay. while we have a good chance um is the like the doubt that can be associated with your theoretical approaches with disability studies yeah. like a lot of us worry about like well this language isn't exactly right or um well we didn't really like uh kelsey for instance brought up um mm -hmm. she's working on ptsd and much do mm -hmm. and the um the fact that it didn't exist you know um mm -hmm. nick is also thinking about neurodivergence and was very careful to say like he's not diagnosing anybody he's just sort of looking for forebears um or um, ancestors maybe um and so um that that stuff like we really appreciate your careful and scholarly hesitation in a certain way um mm -hmm. but also this is this seminar is a place where you don't have to worry about that um we want to welcome you to do the work and use the terms and make up terms that work for you and what you're trying to pull out of these texts and this is part of the play of our seminar um you know a, a play as in a move that we make right like we want to welcome those plays um from you yeah absolutely i just second that wholeheartedly um feel free to not have to spend 10 pages explaining that what you mean when you say disability unless that's productive for you right right but don't feel the need to defend the existence of disability in the early modern period um yeah. here we're yeah. free to do other stuff. Yeah, we will. We will grant you, right? Um, we will. <laughs> we will. We will give you every benefit, um, not of doubt either, because we don't doubt you, right? No, but we, we will go you. with no. you where you want to go. We're really yeah. excited. Um, so, Absolutely. so don't worry about anachronism. Don't worry about stuff like that. Just do your work, and if you need help figuring out how to explain it that's also something our seminar can be here for outside of like the exciting new ground you're covering in yeah. your work yeah absolutely um the main focus of our video today is that we uh in reading through your posts really sort of saw um a set of like three and a half um instruments or strategies or like concepts maybe themes uh, showing up uh, in the papers 
that we thought could be really useful, valuable tools for a, many different people uh, in the seminar. Um, and they are the habitual body, uh, the Aristotelian tripartite schema for disability, uh, and let me move my mouse over to the other thing, uh, and disability structures, which really is sort of the guiding principle of, of all of those. Oh, and our a half is uh, transtemporal identification. So we're just going to talk through those very briefly, make the sketchiest of connections amongst uh, the work that you've started to do here. Um, and hopefully that will, um, we both want it to showcase some of the really excellent like theorizing you're doing of disability and ability in the early modern period, but also um, make, make those tools a little bit more easily available for everyone to use and give you a jumping off point. Um, we're going to be connecting different, we might say, oh, your paper, we see it doing this. And maybe your answer is going to be, no, it doesn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. Please don't hear the connections we're drawing here as instructional. Don't feel like you need to go, you know, write the paper on what we said. Uh, we're just throwing this out there because uh, we hope it might be useful, even if it's useful uh, to oppose it. Yeah. Also, um, because you may be feeling like, I don't know, like I'm not really fitting with the rest of the seminar, but you are. And so yeah. that, that's always my experience at SAA. And so <laughs> I just want to make sure that everybody yeah. feels like, you know, you're here where you're supposed to be and doing awesome work. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Um, so the first one we want to talk about is the habitual body, which came up in uh, De Asini's paper. Um, so I'm just going to quote from so, paper, blog post, Dasini's blog post. Okay, so uh, in Institutional Habits, Sarah Ahmed notes that the body is, and I'm quoting here from Ahmed, quote, the body is habitual, not only in the sense that it performs actions repeatedly, but in the sense that when it performs such actions, it does not command attention apart from at the surface where it encounters an external object, such as the hands that lean on the desk or the table, which feel the stress of the action. That's the end of the quote from Ahmed, but I'm still reading now from Bassini. Making visible the performance and presentation of hermaphrodism, therefore, um, this play, Love's Girl, uh, demonstrates the stress incurred in performing normalcy. It shows how, in the instances where the habitual body is the hermaphroditic one, to erase its symptoms and the impulse to nurture some behaviors and cure others, it, that can be just as unnatural. Thus, while the non-heteronormative or hermaphrodic, hermaphroditic body is frequently understood to be an abnormal one, it also suggests a potentially more natural identity than what is prescribed through social customs. Um, we both really loved that uh, yeah. use of Ahmed's uh, concept of the, of the habitual body. Um, mm -hmm. I really liked that uh, it seemed to be adopting this like uh, Heideggerian idea about the broken tool, but like much more effectively than I think Heidegger typically <laughs> is. Um, and, uh, and it just seemed like this model of the habitual body is one that could be applied in a lot of people's work um, in the seminar, uh, maybe to, to really rich ends. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the one of the papers we thought that could be involved with um, is um, is Nick's regarding neurodivergence and the way that neurodivergent folks have to mask, and that makes normalcy really apparent, right? Um, we also thought about this in just very briefly. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Kelsey's work with Don John and how he makes the historical context apparent and like the mm -hmm. habituation of conquest and warfare in the period. Um, we're also thinking about. Oh, I just want to before you before you go yeah, on, yeah. earlier in our early conversation about this, Billy said Don John makes the body of history visible, and I thought that was oh. such a good line. So, Thanks. Good, great work, uh, <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, we're also thinking about. Rachel's work on the Witch of Edmonton and the way that um, the, the, the actions of the witch are characterized by those outside of her as pushing on, like she, like she would be the hand pushing on the table in that quote, right? Um, so um, uh, also in that yeah. one, like the uh, dog, right? The service animal could be 
uh, the the hand, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where 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 you see the the witchcraft applied. Um, yeah. To be an interesting one. Yeah. Um, you you cut out just a tiny bit oh, at the I, end of that. I just okay. want to make sure that you. Um, that we hear right. what all you it said. It could be because I knocked my microphone off my shoulder, or it could be because oh, my uh, my family is outside uh, shoveling our sidewalks, and it's kind of loud. So sorry. <laughs> you're, you're back. I just <laughs> you're back. I just okay. wanted to you know again we are you know people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, and and there are others too. And so I'll just I'll say at this point because I remembered um we're going to along with this video send a document to you mm -hmm. with kind of an outline of what we're saying and so if you lose this <laughs> um in in our conversation here uh the, the document might help yeah mm -hmm. yeah so um uh, i think if uh did we talk about penny and the no, habitual body should. of maybe the last one. Yeah. Uh, that was another uh, place where we saw the habitual body approach might, might work um, in terms of thinking about uh, both legitimacy as a place where, um, uh, where the bastard makes visible the, the sort of the system of, of legitimacy. But also, I, I was just really struck by the idea of habit as a model um yeah. and bodies as a place where that habit comes through when talking about jurisprudence right where where mm -hmm. jurisprudence is so entirely dependent right the foundation of it is precedent and precedent is habit um yeah and so so there seem to be like multiple places where that could be that could that could be valuable yeah and and extending this maybe a little bit further also in regate in relation to penny's work but just in general as a structure um you know we use we use the body as a metaphorical structure for things anyway right because like mm -hmm. ostensibly we all have one and we kind of know how they work um but the um like so so that made me think of like habituation or habitual actions in the body politic as well um so in lear which penny is working on um, we can definitely see that at work, um, but you can you can think of other sort of habitual bodies, right? Bodies of text, bodies of work. Um, you know, that that might be a useful approach to body if it's useful. I don't know. Um, and then the last the last note I think we had there was talking about Susan. Mm -hmm. um, should we talk about Susan already? Yeah. I don't know. Susan okay. talked about well. me, <laughs> hyperability of the audience there, and how um, seeing uh, the habitual habitual actions on stage when they're disrupted, like disrupt things for the audience, and the audience mm -hmm. knows things that the characters on stage don't, and that again is a place where um we're thinking of like that that pressing on the table right the making a parent of a non-habitual action um could be could be useful yeah um the second model that we saw showing up uh was introduced by susan uh, the idea of the aristotelian tripartite schema for disability um so i'm quoting susan here I'd like to frame my discussion in an Aristotelian tripartite scheme where, dis where ability is a means and is opposed not just to disability, but also conversely to hyperability. And that excess is also a problem in these texts. I'm not claiming that this has any more validity as a moral schema than binary oppositions, exclamation mark in parentheses, but it's definitely available as a possible framework in the period itself, which I like. And it's also useful in terms of allowing a way to make sure my analysis brings ability into play too. I can look at whether there are places where there is too much speech, too little speech, and just the right amount. Uh, and I, I just totally affirm that. I think that's an incredibly useful structure, as Susan points out, specifically for this historical period in time. I, I think, you know, in as much as we at the beginning said, like, don't worry about, like, trying to <laughs> be, you know, play the, is it anachronistic game? But I think at the same time, I also really do want to like attend to the historical specificities of early modern disability. And I think thinking about it in this as a mean, as an Aristotelian mean, mm -hmm. um, is, is a really, really sharp way to do that. Um, obviously, we see that uh, in, in Susan's, like as Susan correctly identifies in her own work, 
but it was definitely something we also saw in Kasha's talking about pregnancy, um, where the pregnant body in some ways is the like Aristotelian mean for early modern women that like uh, it is the, the sort of the ideal, um, not, not too infertile, not too fertile, right? Like um, you sort of get to that, that perfection there. We also saw it in Melanie's um, discussion of gender and the way that there's like disabled uh, gender performance by women where um, they have to sort of thread that needle um, of ability in terms of desire. And we thought that that could absolutely be a, a useful way of understanding that. Um, and then there was at least one. A slightly, other. yeah, it was John. Um, so like John. With, with a slight difference perhaps, right? And especially in terms of the work he's actually doing to undo the notion of this mean, which is, um, you know, fluency as a mean and then disfluency below that and hyperfluency or like Shakespeare, right, above it. Um, and so the, the thing that got us thinking in that direction was like sort of Shakespeare as a measure of ability. Um, and so, um, Again, John is trying to undo that notion of the mean there, um, but uh, but it's still there. Yeah, um, and, and actually, I think that there's a lot of other places that that could be applied to, um, but we just didn't think this video to be an hour and a half long. <laughs> um, yeah. The, uh, the third structure that we looked at uh, was actually disability structures. Uh, which Rachel introduced in her post. She said, I'm quoting Rachel, the parallels to the social model of disability are obvious here. She's talking about um, witchcraft, though I do not wish to stretch them too far. But I think this example shows us that looking at witchcraft as a disability structure, as opposed to merely considering witches as disabled figures, has reasonable 17th century basis. Elizabeth Sawyer is impaired, but witchcraft is imposed on her by social expectations as enforced by her peers. Again, this struck me as a, a hugely applicable model, thinking about disability structures versus disability figures or disabled characters or language, right? What are the structures that are making this happen? Um, uh, and also one that is uniquely historically specific, um, a, a way to retain these sort of unique qualities of early modern ability and disability. Mm -hmm. um, and under the note about like how this could, like whose papers connect to this, I wrote, I don't know, everyone? <laughs> it really seems uh, hugely applicable. Uh, anyone talking about performance, ultimately is gonna end up talking about structures in some way. Um, the folks who are talking about fools, I thought Nicole in particular, thinking about the, the disabled structures of foolishness. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, also people thinking about performance and the body of the performer. So um, Miles, I thought this was yeah, a place for thinking about um, the way in which the body of the actor is a structure, possibly a disabled structure um, with which to work. Mm -hmm. um, also in Miles, uh, something that we talked about is his use of Sydney's phrase, instruct and delight, like that phrase as a structure that leads to thinking about formal structure um, in this period and, and interrogating disability. Um, Nick, we thought about uh, structures of knowledge and knowledge production coming up a lot in, um, in, in his post. Yeah. Um, with, uh, with Melanie, we thought about structures of desire and early modern femininity and gender. Um, and she herself has brought in structures like the one sex model um, mm -hmm. and things like, you know, to work within and against and around. Um, uh, Dea Sini's work made us think that maybe deviation is itself a structure, and maybe not an intervention, so to speak, but more something that's built in to mm -hmm. conversations of normal, about normalcy. Um, yeah. and monstrosity. And then, um, yeah, so, but, but this is only some, right? There, there are lots of ways that all of your papers can work into this. Um, and while Lindsay was talking about 
structure and performance just a second ago, um, I, um, I thought about like, you know, maybe the most obvious structure, but maybe not the playhouse structure. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, that's, you know, that's a huge structure to deal with when we're thinking about aesthetics of performance and the way performances work and um, all of that stuff. So that would work in with pretty much everybody's as well. And I also think too, we're thinking about structure here as as a scaffold that you could use mm -hmm. for any ver for various means, right? Like you can talk about structures of ableism, right? Penny and jurisprudence, mm -hmm. right? But jurisprudence fundamentally is this ableist yeah. system yeah. as it's set up in the early modern period. But also we can talk about structures of disability, right? What what right. is supporting and upholding um, disability in a positive sense, um, mm -hmm. and and how do we see systems that uh, facilitate um, disability and not just facilitate ableism. Um, right. So I think, yeah, it's it's just a really, we really loved that, that, that like, that turn that Rachel was making and we thought that it would be mm -hmm. one that would be useful possibly to replicate for other folks. Um, yeah. Finally, our like last half one, uh, half only because it is maybe not as applicable to everyone's, but, um, and because it's an idea that is like still very like kind of emerging. Um, is the the last sentence uh, is uh, the comes from the last sentences of Nick's post. Um, Nick says, "My goal here is, of course, not to diagnose early modern characters, but rather to find places where contemporary neurodivergence might read their ancestors into early modern plays." Which I love that phrase. If ableism and sexism can echo from century to century, might not activism and resistance find ways to do the same? And I read that I was reminded immediately of, um, if you've not had a chance, go watch um, on the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies on their YouTube page. You can watch, they did a round table recently on um, the future of early, or sorry, the future of medieval disability studies. And in it, Rick Godden, um, who is just like a fabulous medieval scholar, um, talks about the issue of what he calls transtemporal identification. Um, the reading of contemporary disabled experience alongside medieval disabled experience in order to see both of them more clearly. Um, and I also, the, the other place where I see this call being offered is in um, uh, an article that Sawyer Kemp wrote in Shakespeare Studies. I, I um, mention it in the, my response to Nick's post. It's based out of a uh, next gen plan talk that Sawyer gave at the SAA like six years ago. But it's still like one of my clearest memories ever of hearing an academic paper that I heard it was just like, this is, this is true. I'm um, talking about understanding, being able to see the, the historical specificities of uh, early modern trans experience better when you read them alongside contemporary trans experience. And I, I think that applies to disability um, really effectively um, and, and I definitely see, I mean, Nick's paper ends with that call. And I just want to say, yeah. or, or with the desire to make that move. And I want to say that move is being called forth um, in, in a bunch of different places from Rick, from Sawyer. Um, and I think you're going to hear more of it. And I just affirm people's move to answer that call. I definitely see that um, in Kelsey's work on CTSD. I see it in Miles's talking about anachronistic aesthetics and thinking about mm -hmm. um, contemporary understandings of aesthetics alongside uh, early modern ideas, um, and, and in a couple of other places. Um, if you go watch that talk that Rick gives, he makes this beautiful comparison between a scene in a, in a medieval Arthurian tale where every knight of the round table like prods the wound of one knight um, and compares it to his experience of being prodded by like teams of uh, neurologists. And it's, uh, it's so illuminating. And so uh, I also just think that that's a strategy that can be hugely applicable to a bunch of different people's papers. Um, so that's something to think about too. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, so as you can tell, we are bursting 
just bursting with excitement. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if the, the video will be gallery mode or speaker mode, but I've been over here like this the whole time uh, since he's been talking. Um, and she does similarly when I'm speaking. Um, and not just because we love each other, but because we love you and we love your papers yeah. so much. Um, and, and they're not even papers yet. They're ideas, they're blog posts, and we cannot wait to see what will happen next. Speaking of what will happen next, um, in January, in the third week or so, we're going to ask you for another blog post, um, building on what you've done so far, thinking through more ideas. Um, between now and then, if you are interested in writers groups, get in touch with us and we will put you in contact with other people from the seminar who are interested in the same things um, as far as like, what you would like. Out of a writer's group. Um, so these are low stakes, low key. Um, they're y'all, not us, um, and uh, not required. But some of you asked for this kind of support and structure. And if that sounds delightful to you, then let us know and we'll set you up. I will also say the next step after that is your second blog post, which uh, we're asking you to uh, post sometime in the third week of January, um, which uh, can be a follow-up to what you're doing. It can be something totally new if you felt like, you know, moved in that direction. Yeah. Um, it can be just the next part of your paper if you're writing it like, you know, A to Z, uh, whatever works for you. We also, both of us were like, wow, everyone's posts are so professional and yes. great. Um, <laughs> If that's what is working for you, keep it up. Uh, but if you also feel the pressure of the beginning of a new semester and yeah. moving, you know, closer to things, and I don't know, also the end of January, which is just like the worst time in the entire year for me. Um, uh, if your blog post is extremely provisional and much sketchier than your first one, uh, okay. that is also fine. Yeah. We welcome uh, we welcome things that are in process. So uh, feel no pressure to be uh, polished. If you are, and that's valuable to you, fabulous. But um, there is, uh, we are also doing our best to offer you the freedom to sketch and um, yeah. try stuff out. Also speaking of sketching and trying stuff out, um, the, the blog is yours. You are welcome to post in between calls for posts from everybody. Um, you, you can, you know, make them private or public. It's up to you. Um, you're, you're as much a part of that as we are. And so if you are in, you know, next week, if you're like, oh, I wonder what people would say about this, put it on the blog. It's fine. Um, I look at it at least a couple times a week. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but I'll answer you. Um, so, um, you know, feel, feel free to sort of work things out between your more official blog posts too, if that's something that, again, is useful for you. Um, we hope that uh, you are relaxing and uh, safe wherever you are and um, enjoying some uh, like warm drinks and uh, a feeling of coziness, unless you hate that, and then, I don't know, enjoy the tropics. Um, <laughs> and um, we're just so grateful uh, to get to be a part of this with you. So yeah. uh, have a restful break, and uh, we're excited to keep working with you more in 2021. So excited. Thank you all.